As of today, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports six cases of the coronavirus here in the United States. So, how at risk are we here in Louisiana? Fox 14's Chelsea Jones joins us now to debunk the myths surrounding the virus. Chelsea? Sarah, the fact is the coronavirus is common, so much so that the name has been used before as a term for the common cold. But health officials say the newest strain is making people very sick. But more likely than not, residents here in this state don't have much to worry about. The new coronavirus, a different one that they think might possibly have come from either bats or cats in China. But the good news, if you haven't been to Wuhan, China in the last month, you're probably okay. The average person in Louisiana is at very little to almost no risk of getting this. We don't really know if it'll no come to this small town. And the reality is we don't. As the number of coronavirus cases continue to rise around the country, there are certain areas with large numbers of cases of growing concern. And now Louisiana has more cases per capita than every other state except for New York and Washington. Big Z Country, Z1075 listeners, it's 5 o'clock, and per the orders of our governor, John Bell Edwards, the state of Louisiana is at a stay-at-home order due to coronavirus until further notice. If you have any coronavirus questions, call the 24-hour hotline, 211. I'm Patrick Hall, Afternoon Talent on 107.5, broadcasted live all throughout North Louisiana and Southern Arkansas. I can't go see my family members. I can't go do my normal routine like I do. And now I have to wear a bandana around my neck. So when I go out in public, I have my own face mask. So I have to use a surgical face mask so they can be used for first responders and people on the front lines of this. So, yeah, my world had not been turned upside down. I still get to work every day. I still have my normal routine. But outside of my work life and home life, there's pretty much nothing else. And for a radio DJ, getting out in the community is the number one thing that I do every day before and after work. So that part has been hard. Uh, all going all the way back to, you know, the Louisiana Purchase and before then, we've always helped out our neighbor in Louisiana. If you're going out to a park as a family and you're playing soccer with other people, you're not helping out your neighbor. That soccer ball is a transfer and carrier of coronavirus. A tennis ball, a basketball. If you're going out to the basketball courts and shooting hoops, and you're shooting with somebody from the neighborhood, you're not staying at home. You're not self-isolating. And I think that's the big problem right now. People don't really understand in their life how to self-isolate and how to stay at home because, well, we're not ever forced to do it. People are going to start wearing masks more often. You know, we used to laugh, laugh at Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson always wore a surgical mask for the last, like, seven years of his life. Every time he went out in public, he wore that mask. I don't think folks are laughing at Michael Jackson anymore for wearing that mask because it's going to be a normal, everyday thing. In China, they've been wearing masks for the last two decades because of pollution and problems over there and illnesses. I used to laugh at people, scratch my head at people in the airport that were wearing a, a mask. I don't anymore. I'm one of them. I got to wear a mask too. When I come to the radio station, our boss makes us have a bandana on and then every time we enter and leave a room, we have to either wash our hands or use hand sanitizer. And I think that's going to be the new norm for sure. I think there's going to be more online shopping, more online things. I think movies are going to go straight to on demand versus movie theaters. I think people are going to be using their backyards and their home space as their safe space now. Where normally, you know, your backyard was there for summertime fun. I think your backyard's going to be there for year-round fun now. about the way we do anything except cook and package to-go orders. We've uh, always done to-go's and deliveries and things like that. That's a good part of our business, and lunch especially. And we do chef taxi also. But uh, it's changed everything we do but the way we cook and package stuff because if the prep work is, you can imagine how everybody's off. I mean, the percentage is astounding. Uh, even the big Cisco companies, food companies are out, you know, are off. 
uh, all the restaurants that have closed because they, for whatever reason. Safety's another thing. And, and of course, ours is, Brad's my, been here with me 23 years. He's my nephew. And we've always worked together. My wife's in there, and she's the one you talk to. And the only other two people that are normally here sometimes were busy. And we're not busy except right at lunch and right at go home time from work, you know, five o'clock. Uh, my daughter Emma and Brad's wife Colette. So it's just us five doing the whole deal. We don't have any employees. We laid them all off where they could uh, run on employment. And, uh, and, and, and of course for safety factor too, too many people from too many places coming in, coming out. We can say this is the same five every time. And we all are going home directly after work and staying there until the next day. You know, we end up putting in 12 hours a day, about 12 hours a day. You know, we made him get here at 8. And sometimes we get out of here by 7.30, but most of the time it's 8 o'clock. And uh, we open up the kitchen really about 10.30, honestly. Uh, anybody calls at 10, 15, 10.30, we're going to get them something to eat. Uh, we're doing the same thing we are. You don't mind me talking, right? Yeah, you're good. Uh, we're doing, we're starting to whittle out. The menu is the one thing that's affecting what we do. Uh, we don't have char grilled oysters anymore because we're not going to buy oysters and sit there and let them go bad. Uh, we actually get uh, fresh big eye tuna flown in from Honolulu every week, somewhere between 50 and 60 pounds. That is no longer happening. That guy won't ship me uh, 20 pounds. And I'll have that many good regular customers, maybe. But I mean, you know, I don't blame him. You, 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 can't, you can't do that. It's free shipping, basically, for him, me to buy 60 pounds of, of $20, a $20 a pound tuna. But we, we sold it all every week. But now we're not selling that. This, today was the last day I had a piece and I sold what I'm done with. Uh, and the guy and I have a personal relationship. He calls every week just to say, hey man, how y'all doing? You know. So uh, it's a shame. that's a shame. Uh, the local companies that we buy from, uh, that, that they've all pretty much, of course, it's all hit surprised everyone, right? So we had a pretty good shipment come in on Friday before the Monday that they said it's over with, basically. So we're trying to still sell that food and not waste. And we froze a lot of it that we could not use. The only thing that we're doing, basically getting from anybody right now, is produce from Roberts produce and I'm sure what we get from them is a tenth of what we normally get from them right uh, so it, it's that, that kind of deal going on uh, you know, and I'm not all doom and gloom about it I mean luckily Brad and I started this place cooking back here and we had actually 25 employees almost we, the total of the restaurant probably close to 50, 45 people and probably 15 to 20 of them were back here and some of them Four of them they would be 20 years. And I had to send them home. So yeah, <laughs> that was heartbreaking to me. The, the guys that I've raised basically from 17, 18 years old. Uh, and uh, hopefully they'll come back. You know, and I hope this will go down and we can get started on a regular bit. But uh, that's it. You think it's gonna get worse or better? <laughs> that, that would be, uh, I quit foot, uh, gambling football. When I opened the restaurant, I started gambling on the restaurant and myself. So I quit gambling football 25 years ago. So I can't even gamble at that. You know, I see that all the, my wife watches a lot of the news and will kind of relay messages to me. Uh, it seems like what I guess I heard was there are more cases right now in, in our, basically, I'm concerned about everybody obviously, but Monroe's a big part of what I'm worried about. So if it doesn't grow anymore, maybe it is gonna turn the corner. Maybe we will you know, in a couple of weeks or three weeks or whatever it is uh, get better, I hope. But man, as far as venturing the guests, got no idea. Horse or shrimp etouffee, all this in here is sold. All that shrimp creole, we're shipping that out. People have asked for that. So those are things we're trying to do that we don't necessarily focus on when we're cooking for the public, right? But we got it out on Facebook, so we get a lot of people saying, hey, yeah, I like that black and chicken out of So you get, you can get a pan for 25 bucks. Right. Front feeds about four people real good, so that's cheap enough. You know, that's eight dollars a person for a big pan of alfredo with no bread in it and stuff like that. Uh, 
Yes, that is one thing. He's making another Alfredo sauce since it started a week ago this past Monday, right? Yeah. We've made 10 or 10 buckets of Alfredo. So that me, you know, so it's helped our business survive, if we call this survival. You know, uh, payroll, next two weeks won't be any payroll, so that'll be a big, big deal. Uh, payroll is, because of, because of 20 year employees, it may be a touch higher percentage wise than a lot of people think it should be. But we try to pay our guys good enough to keep them over, you know? And uh, so, you know, I'm not, payrolls have gone up expeditiously, or whatever you call that, since we opened. Obviously, somebody stays with you every year. You try to revisit and give them a little bump, you know, give them a little pay raise. classrooms with their students. You have some teachers who are uh, just who are posting assignments online for their students as enrichment. And like we said, uh, the district passed out packets to students uh, for them to work on during this time where they're out of school. So the teachers, the administrators, uh, the school board uh, that's a part of Monroe City Schools is doing an excellent job of making sure that not only are the students still engaged during this time, but that the teachers and the faculty and staff are all engaged as well. Uh, and it's a, it's a proud moment for Monroe City Schools. On the weekends, when I'm not working, I'm at home. I'm not going anywhere. I, I shop for the week instead of the, the, the day, as the governor has instructed. You know, I don't eat out. I cook at the house. I made some chicken breast last night. They were very good. It, you, you have, if you adhere to what those who have given us the, the, the instructions and the suggestions, if you adhere to what they're saying, stay at home. If you're out six feet away, uh, no touching right now because we're trying to save lives. Like I've seen, there was video yesterday of a gathering at a local school of about 50 people standing out in the parking lot together. Uh, we, we're out here at the park and it is full. Uh, there are a lot of people who are here for church functions, uh, they're reading scripture with each other. Some people are playing softball, some are having full-blown tennis tournaments out in the park. This isn't surprising to me because I've seen it even before the stay-at-home order where, you know, they were telling us hang out with 10 people at a time and no more than 10 at a time and then they said don't even do that just social distancing stay at home there were kickball games going on and people just hanging out in the park in groups and in droves just to 
it's some just really flying in the face of the order. Now, I will say the group that we saw when we first walked in, it was like nine guys, and they were all six feet away from each other, like just reading scripture to each other, and that's, I guess that's fine. Uh, but it's, what we're seeing today, I, it doesn't really surprise me. I just pray for the safety of all of these people and hope that, it, you know, they are not affected by what's going on in our world right now, because there's a lot of kids out here. The God of the storm is, is Lord over every storm of our lives. And we all have uh, storms that come to us in varied and different times of seasons of our lives in varied styles and ways and things that we didn't see coming that sometimes come and knock us in the middle of next week. We've all had our hopes and our dreams and even our sandcastles blown away from time to time. We've had our share of difficulty. And you're probably sitting right there in your living room or wherever you are listening to me right now. And you can immediately think of some dreams that went south on you. Every once in a while, we back up and say, my goodness, why in the world is this storm hitting me like it's hitting me right now? But everyone, they come from different areas, but they all have a purpose. Storms in life reveal some things about us. They reveal the nature of our faith. They reveal the strength of our commitment. They reveal the level of our maturity, the health of our attitude. They, they reveal the, the, our teachability. Storms come into our lives, but they're all not useless. Every storm can have with it a lesson, even the storm that we find ourselves in now. Um, I'm thinking, well, we're all scrambling, right? As pastors and leaders and teachers um, in the body of Christ, every church that I know of is just scrambling and grappling with, hey, how do we do this? How do we, how do we communicate to the people? How do we keep people encouraged? How do we minister to sick people? How do we uh, continue uh, with uh, church ministry? And so uh, it was a little challenging uh, at first. Um, thankfully, I've got a great team around me um, that really helped navigate through some of that stuff. And we're still navigating, frankly. Uh, Easter's upon us and we're, we're conversing back and forth about ideas for Easter. But um, so it was a, a little bit of a shock, but at the same time, uh, trying, to, trying to move and shift with every changing order that came down. So uh, I feel like most churches are doing the best that they can. And so I thank God for that. And people in our community are, are being ministered to around the community. You know, as, as Christians, um, I think we ought to protect our witness and, and in every way do our best to abide by the governor's stay at home orders or at least uh, social distancing and those kinds of things. Um, the governor did make a, an allowance for small gatherings to produce uh, church services, but frankly, church as it was before coronavirus uh, is pretty much shut down. I know there are some who, uh, for whatever reason, I, I'm not here to judge anybody, but aren't, aren't abiding by the governor's wishes and his requests. But I think that just opens us up as a community of believers, as followers of Christ for criticism, um, the Bible teaches us that we're to be subject to those who have authority over us. And certainly our governor is the governor of the state and our president, and we should pray for them. We do. And we should also abide by their wishes because they are on top of the coronavirus far more than any of us could possibly be uh, with knowledge and understanding that, frankly, most pastors would not have. And so I just feel like, and I would just challenge anybody in this state who says, forget the governor's stay at home rule we got religious rights well, listen um you can take that to the nth degree but i just want to say that as a community of christ followers we don't give ourselves a black eye by um, ignoring uh, those who are leading us in governmental uh, affairs i think we do better by just saying god we know we're trusting you in this and we're going to abide by the governor's orders and we're going to worship at home and uh so pastors can put things together. You know, um, it's a difficult thing. Thankfully, I have a large team, but I know that, that what we're doing here with a, a iPhone and uh, some apps and a, a $50 microphone and a, a $75 light, you can do so much from the living room of your home and still communicate to your people. And I, I saw a little meme or a, 
a banner post on Facebook a year ago, pastors were screaming, Facebook's of the devil, you know? Now they're saying, hey, watch us on Facebook. So uh, thank God for social media. That's just one of the platforms. But we can do so much as we abide by and honor uh, the wishes of our government, people who are smarter than we are in these, in these matters, frankly. Pastors have had to shift to an online format. If we're going to do church right now, it's going to be online. And um, would I rather be with physically with the church family? Oh, you better believe it, man. I am a people person. I love people. Um, and the Book of Acts model, frankly, was um, breaking bread together, sharing one another fellowship. They continued in the Apostles' Doctrine, Acts 2.42. Um, but we can do that in a limited degree just through the technology that's at our fingertips. And so it's not fun to adapt. It's not easy to adapt, but adapt we must until this uh, COVID-19 thing is in the rearview mirror. And so it's not that easy, but we can do it. Pastors can do it. Church leaders can do it. Staff pastors can do it and set up an online blog, set up a little video chat group with people uh, in in video chat rooms and um, you know um, we, we're doing it through our church and our, our church family's doing it and we did it last night with with eight of our family members some in Atlanta some in Lafayette Gina Lizzie Monroe and we all just got on zoom and uh, man we had a great time so you can do that with with people that you love and I would just encourage you to do that we need each other we were we were built we were wired for one another and the Bible is full of one another's statements, love one another, pray for one another, support with one another, weep with one another, rejoice with one another, over and over and over again, one another things are in the Bible. But right now, the only way we can do that is through uh, technology that's been provided by us, by the wisdom that God has given people. It blows my mind. I don't understand how it all works, but I'm really grateful that we have it. You know, there's a lot of good that can come out of this rather than uh, just negative. Um, and frankly, I know our church, Christ Church is reaching more people during these times than we ever dared to reach on a Sunday morning. Um, we're, the, the, there are more people during this time that are looking up, uh, more people praying, more people reaching out to God, more people looking for online resources to encourage themselves. You know, if you sit in a house long enough, the walls start closing in on you and you need to, may need to get out and take a walk in the sunshine and get some vitamin D pumping into your body. But um, I think that, that the resources are there for us and we should take advantage of them. I would rather be with people, but right now it's just not possible. It's not wise, it's not feasible. And so, as we are practicing social distancing and staying at home and being responsible in our citizenship, um, I know that the Spirit of God is going to sustain us. You know, um, we are close, as close to the Book of Acts Church right now as we've ever been. And when we're meeting with family and just having church and Bible studies, so it's a, it's a great time for people to draw close to God and uh, worship Him uh, even more, we got, we, we're home more, we've got, I know a lot of people are working from home, a lot of people are still having to go to work, but for those of us who are just at home and, and some working from home, but there's, there's a lot of time during the day just to get in the Word, get some prayer time in, extra worship time in, and you can do all of that through the beauty of your home. And so thank God for that and for um, making that available to us. When Gail started this, she started out asking everybody for five dollars. Five dollars. Well, it blew up. In a day and a half, two days, she raised over three thousand dollars. So there was a lot of people in this community that didn't have milk or a piece of bread or anything to drink, and it just broke her heart. She hadn't slept in a week, I'm sure. So I said, Gail, I want to help. So we partner up and we call it now, this is the Gail Cupid Project, this is her baby. I just want to help. And she is just, it's ran. So it, it, she has done so amazing. And I'm following her lead, this is our queen. They just can't sleep at night if somebody's hungry. So this woman has been phenomenal.
For me, the importance of this is for being the hands and feet of Christ. I'm blessed every day, and my husband and I say we could not go home every night and lay our heads on our pillow while we have the ability to do something that we feel during this pandemic the Lord has deemed us to do. He has laid this on us. Um, we can now sleep at night seeing people that we fed during the day and knowing that children and adults as well are gonna eat. And not only for today, for the next several days, they're going to have food. So um, it's not about me, it's not about my husband or anyone that's helping us. It is simply about people hurting and our community. And I'm so proud of the way our community has come together. Um, we're so thankful. Stacey Albright Mitchell. I am the mayor of the city of West Monroe. My number one concern um, about the coronavirus is that life will not exist the way we have always known it. Is how do we get back to the sense of normalcy? Um, obviously, people's health, people's uh, mental state, our economy, just all of that combined. So, really, there's not one number one concern. It's it's all of us. It's us as a whole. How we function every day. It, that, it, that is my number one concern. So now obviously we, we have to function and the economy does have to keep keep running. So, but you have to practice your social distancing guidelines. You, you must wash your hands. You must be um, concerned and uh, be respectful of your fellow uh, citizen your fellow, you know, when you're in a grocery store or, or somewhere that you have to be. So I don't think it's political. I think that it is true. The social distancing works. It is, um, I get an update from not only the Glenwood Hospital CEO, but obviously our parish leaders about how our, you know, we don't, we don't want to overcome our supply of hospital beds and ventilators and that type of thing. And it's, it's a life or death situation. So we want to make sure that, that we do flatten that curve um, while maintaining some sense of normalcy there. Um, I am the leader of West Monroe, and I am here to keep us all functioning, um, acting somewhat normal, keeping the government afloat, as well as I'm here for all of our residents, our citizens, and I have a job to do, and that is what we do. Hello, I'm Jamie Mayo, Mayor of the City of Monroe, and on behalf of our City Council and all of our citizens here in the City of Monroe, we're here to give you regular updates on the COVID-19 disease. We all are very concerned about the coronavirus. And of course, when we first heard about it, it was something that uh, we took very seriously from the start. Anytime that you hear anything about a virus, but we had no idea that it would have the magnitude that it has had uh, over the last several weeks. And of course, I want to commend our president, also our governor of the state of Louisiana, Governor John Bell Edwards, for their initiative and their commitment to at least communicating to the public and doing everything that we can to help save our citizens here in the United States as well as in the state of Louisiana. Here in the city of Monroe, we've done an awful lot to try to communicate to our citizens as well, talking to them about, about uh, these uh, measures that we can take, mitigation measures to help like social distancing, as well as washing your hands for at least 20 seconds and not getting together as a group, whether you're going to organization meetings, or club meetings, or whatever the case may be, but to exercise uh, just, just uh, social distancing. But again, this is something that has not happened since probably 1912, and we do not have a playbook to go by or a guide to go by. Uh, but we do have uh, standards, we do have the healthcare profession, professional that's working extremely hard, but a lot of the hospital beds are, are filling up in other parts of the country, such as New York and in California. And we certainly hope that that does not happen here in the uh, city of Monroe, but if it does, we've already offered our Civic Center to St. Francis and to some other uh, healthcare providers. And so we just don't know how long it's gonna last. We're hoping that it will end pretty soon, but it's important for everybody to, again, to exercise social distancing, to make sure that we can minimize the, the spread of this horrendous virus, and also that we can flatten the curve, because as long as the curve is going up,
terms of those that are being detected, uh, it's going to cons considerably get worse. But uh, we really need cooperation. Please keep safe and stay safe. So I'm uh, Gary Jones. I'm a, a family practice physician. I'm one of the founders of Vantage Health Plan. Uh, 25 years ago. I'm the CEO and Chief Medical Officer for Vantage Health Plan. And then we also, Vantage uh, is owner of Affinity Health Group, which is a large physician group practice uh, in Northeast Louisiana. And then we also are owner of Monroe Surgical Hospital, which is a 10-bed surgery hospital in Monroe. Probably a lot of things aren't going to go back to the way we used to do them. Uh, just for instance, uh, this interview you and I are doing now over Zoom, uh, everybody's, you know, just as an employer at Vantage, um, we've moved almost all of our meetings to either WebEx or Microsoft uh, meetings or uh, to Zoom. And so, you know, we used to, we'd have a large meeting in one of our uh, large meeting rooms with 20 or 30 people, or we'd have a, a group of 10 meeting in a boardroom, conference room. Uh, we've moved everything now to, to WebEx or some other uh, video chat. Uh, we've also have almost half our employees now working from home at Vantage. A little harder to do with our Affinity Health Group uh, with all of our clinics. But um, anyway, as an employer, we're using technology more than we ever have. And um, I think because people are getting used to it, uh, I doubt we go back to the old way of doing things. It's so much easier. You can go to three or four meetings from your desk from home, if you're traveling, you, you, it's really easy to do. So I think it's gonna really push those types of meetings. As a uh, healthcare provider, it's really changed a lot too. We knew that telemedicine was coming. And as a health plan, we have our own transportation services that we provide to our members. So you probably have seen some of the affinity vans uh, out around the countryside. So Vantage actually ensures Medicare members, uh, large group commercial groups, and we're one of the plans on the individual exchange and the small group exchange in Louisiana. And we have our own vans and drivers that pick our members up that have transportation problems and take them to their providers. So one of the nice things about telemedicine is if the patient uh, could have been treated by a video chat program like we're doing, uh, they could have spared themselves the expense or trouble of, of traveling a long way to their provider's office. A lot of um, medical visits can be done by video chat. I mean, upwards of probably 50%. And, um, and so this has really pushed us because we were concerned about our patients that come in for regular checkups that have chronic illnesses being in a waiting room with someone who was coughing or having respiratory symptoms. As soon as it started, we reached out to all of our uh, providers and asked them to call all their patients that were on their schedules and to convert as many of those to telemedicine visits as they could to keep those chronically ill people out of our waiting rooms and, in, and keep them at home where they were safer. Um, at the same time, we put up signs outside our clinics to tell anybody, anyone who had an acute illness to call a respiratory hotline that we set up. I, th I think this is really gonna change things going forward and make us a society that um, makes it harder for uh, a virus like this to cause a pandemic in that um, we, we're gonna start using are going to start using technology more, both for education. I think you're going to start seeing education move, move, move more and more toward technology. Uh, businesses, as I said, uh, our business will never go back to the way it used to be because we've already embraced the technology now. Most of this technology we've had for years, uh, but it was a change in the way we did business. And so it took something like this to push us into using that technology, but it's been here. And same with telemedicine. Um, you know, before we had COVID-19, we still had the flu, and yet we had people coming in our offices with chronic illnesses, sitting in the same waiting room with people who were coughing. Um, we changed that immediately when COVID-19 came out. We started treating people that we could at home to keep them completely out of the office. 
We moved people with chronic illnesses that did not have an acute illness to the morning visits. And we moved people with acute infectious illnesses to the evening, preferably after 3 p.m. in the evening. So we're keeping them separate. And then um, I don't think that that's going to go back to the way it used to be. I think we're probably going to continue to schedule patients to keep those populations separate and probably won't have people come into our office unless they need a test or some blood work or something. If it's just a regular follow-up visit, see how people are doing on the medications and things, we'll probably do that by telemedicine and let them stay home. I think the growth rate per population in Louisiana is simply because of Mardi Gras. Simply because of Mardi Gras, that's it. The Mardi Gras, every, somebody from every parish went to Mardi Gras. You know that already. Multiple people from every parish went to Mardi Gras. Whether or not they came in contact with COVID, we don't know, but they possibly were carriers back to every single parish in the state of Louisiana, which is scary if you think about it. Mardi Gras was a huge success, just like every year, a great time, probably a needed time. But what we didn't know was there was a silent enemy called coronavirus that was circulating all throughout New Orleans and all throughout Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras is one of the most international events on the planet. People from every country that had corona currently in it or was about to get a corona outbreak came to New Orleans. If they would have thought about that scope, I got a feeling the governor would have shut it down before it started and then we wouldn't be in this crisis. But you can't look back, you can only look forward. I gladly walk across that desert with no shoes upon my feet to share with you the last five of bread I had to eat. I would swim my to save you in your sea of broken dreams. When all your hopes sink in, let me show you what love means. There you go. <laughs> My given name is Dex Poindexter. Um, I perform in the illusion of Dextasy. I am the current reigning Miss Gay Mid-Atlantic America, and I'm first runner-up to Miss Gay America 2020. I do travel a lot in the Arklatex area. Um, I was just in Dallas and Houston and um, New York City right before this all actually happened. I'm most known for my live impersonation of Winona Judd. Um, and I travel many, many places and impersonate her. And I do other things, but really she's my bread and butter. And that's how a lot of people know my name. Um, but these pageants are made up of some of the most uh, dynamic and talented entertainers across the country. And um, about 50, 45 to 50 of us meet every year in St. Louis and we compete on a national level against each other in different categories like evening gown talent and on stage question, much like the real Miss America format that you see on TV. Um, we do that and there's one winner every year and my day to day life is, you know, I'm doing my regular work, but at night I'm rhinestoning. I'm thinking of new uh, techniques. I'm thinking of makeup. I'm going shopping. I'm researching fabric and what may have worked and what may not have worked for me last time. And literally, Miss Gay America and drag is my Super Bowl. That's what I do once a year is I do Miss Gay America every October and and hope the chips fall the way they should for me. <laughs> but they haven't yet. <laughs> we actually got the notice about two hours ago that um, Miss Gay America is canceled this year. So a lot of my travels, a lot of my bookings, um, those the monies that I make during my drag shows all go into my savings for Miss Gay America. So financially, it's not really hindering me because I, I pay for drag with drag. Um, I never really try to pull out of my personal money for, for that. Uh, but the way it's affected me is now my routine is busted up altogether. Like, what am I going to do on the weekends if I'm not traveling? What am I going to do for a week in October that I usually take off for Miss Gay America? Like a lot of my adult life um, and my off time from my, my job really does revolve around the art form of drag and to not be able to have that outlet. It's like, well, I better find something else to do in the meantime. So it's really, <laughs> it's really trying to come to terms with 
I need a space filler. I need a, you know, a new hobby, but I don't know what that would be because I've done a lot of crap, and, but I'm not hunting. I'm not going to go hunt. <laughs> Have they been asking you to go hunt people? Or what? Yeah, some of my redneck friends, but I just can't do that. <laughs> oh, goodness. You need to go hunting as ecstasy. Right. That'll be a, a yeah. site. Right. Do a Facebook Live from the right. deer stand as ecstasy. Oh, <laughs> but um, have you been seeing these drag queens perform uh, on Facebook Live with uh, in their living rooms or whatnot? Mm-hmm. And and what do you, what do you think about people that do that? And uh, are you going to potentially do that if this lasts months and months and months or what? Um, the people that are doing the shows live are the majority of them are the people that have done it for a living, and when your security blanket of your income is taken away from you, desperate times call for desperate measures. And um, I don't think I'm ever going to be one to do it. Now, will I get in drag and record a video and do a special project? Yeah. But I don't, I don't think I'll ever get to the point where I'm going to do that. Um, because, um, it, you know, people are posting like their Venmo and their cash apps and their PayPal's but I'm not, I, I, I've never relied on drag as my uh, primary source of income. Um, but that's really the only way that some of these people are able to put food on their table because that's all they've known. That's their skill. That's their white collar. That's their blue collar. Um, but yeah, they're, they're in some very tough situations and you know, some of these people made substantial money in drag and now they don't have anything coming in. So they've accumulated these followings over the years and um, basically in hopes of they've entertained their crowd. So hopefully they're going to get some of that reception back. This is something that's going to take a long time to get back to normal because of the safety parameters that, you know, medical field and the legal fields have to go through to make sure that everybody can be taken care of. All right, guys, good morning. I've been thinking about uh, what would be the perfect song for, for our mood right now. I think I found it. So sing along if you know it. So uh, first of all, people have got to learn, if they didn't already know how, they've got to learn how to hustle right now. You know, people have to learn how to use use their own talents and skills to to find ways to make money right now. You know, and no matter what, I mean, if you, if you have been affected financially and you're out of a job or you've been cut back on hours and you have to do that. Now, we live in a virtual world now um, and it's never been you know, more obvious than it is right now. Um, so what we are doing is we're doing a, we basically, the, it's a fundraiser, but I'm actually going to go into it today and kind of change the wording of this because we are benefiting local musicians, but what I've found is the best way to do that right now is to have a virtual venue, which is what we are. Um, so because it, I, I can't fairly distribute the amount of money that I have to local musicians, but what I can do is I can pay people to come on and perform. I, I can pay them a flat rate to come do that. And we can use the funds that we've raised to continue to do that and give them a, a venue when all other venues are closed right now. And what we really need to do is have about, at, you know, at least three or four more of these virtual venues in town that will basically pick up the slack uh, as much as we can. Because whereas some of these musicians might have been making you know, 150 to $200 a night, I can't pay that uh, and sustain what I'm trying to do. So I'm, I'm, I built what I think is, a, you know, me, not just me, but me and Ira Barger have been working on this. And we built what we think is a sustainable model so that we can continue to do this during what we think is going to be, you know, we expect this to at least be through, at least through June. You know, so we got at least at least minimum two months of this that we're going to have to try to do. Um, so, yeah, musicians have um, 
we've had the rug pulled out from under us, those that make a living by playing uh, live music right now. Uh, thankfully, and this is, this is good and bad, uh, but most musicians also have other jobs. Those that still have income, um, they're okay. I mean, I've, I've had a lot of musicians that tell me, hey, I would love to play for you and you don't have to pay me. Um, so what, I, what, but what, I, what we're doing, honestly, because I don't want to have to worry about people coming to me and saying, you know, who's getting paid and, and how's that work and how do I get, how, I'm, a, I'm a musician, how do I get access to those funds? Uh, so I'm telling everybody, look, we're just paying the performers. If you want to donate that to somebody, feel free. But um, yeah, that's kind of the way we're doing. We're running this like, like I said, just treating it like a virtual venue. I always said I would never, ever run a bar or a venue. And uh, I guess times have, times have changed. Um, I have to at this point. Uh, not that I have to, but I always, always do take it on myself to try to take care of everybody as much as I can. So, so I guess the trick right now is to is to have is to present it in a way that feels uh, as professional as possible, and that's tricky right now because we don't have control over the environment. We're having to have everyone just you know uh, set up their phone in their living room or wherever their rehearsal room and just send it to us. Uh, what we are doing is doing is doing a quick sound check. So before before you see them live, they have. Uh, privately sent sent uh, us a stream so that we can check sound and try to get it as good as we can get it. Mm-hmm. So we're trying to have some quality control over that. But right now our main uh, our main worry is sustainability and right now we are we're about a week and a half ahead. So I've got we've got enough money that we've raised that that we could have a week and a half more performances without raising any more. Uh, but then we'd be out. So as long as we stay ahead, then we're okay. And again, that's why we're paying flat rates. I would love to just have the musician on and just have them directly getting all the funds, but I wouldn't be able to sustain that. I wouldn't, you know, because sometimes you're going to have a slow night. uh, And just like a venue, your established people, you want to put them on, uh, they're your they're your crowd they draw your crowd in so you want to put them on your weekend nights right now it's crazy because we still want to make we still want the weekend to feel like the weekend but saturday doesn't feel any different from any other day right now it's, it's no. crazy. like today is monday no, monday right see I'm, I'm, it is monday but I, I don't nothing makes me feel like it's monday um so yeah, so we are taking the uh, the musicians that are are more fledgling or, or don't have the, the huge following, and we're putting them on, you know, Tuesday or Wednesday night, uh, and they may not draw as much fundraising during their uh, show as other people will, but they're getting it is an equal pay thing right now. I mean, as far as total transparency, it is what we are doing is we're paying we're paying sixty dollars. For an hour, we're paying 120 for two hours, um, which is is good money by the hourly rate. But you got to remember that with with this uh, musicians, this is a, this is a special skilled profession. Um, most musicians aren't going to play more than you know two or three gigs a week, and that's the busier ones. So uh, the ones that do it for a living, uh, they do get paid pretty well per hour, but it's uh, you know, you're not just paying them for the time that they're performing. You're paying them for all that time that they're rehearsing and working on this, and getting it ready. That's why I, that's why actors make, you know, millions of dollars per movie. They're not getting paid for the two hour movie that you see. You know, it's all the work behind the scenes. My name is April Massey and I'm the owner of 3-in-1 Roots. 3-in-1 Roots actually started at my kitchen table. Um, and you know, just grew over time. And so I'm always trying to think of like, cause we do have a lot of boutiques in the, in this area. And I'm just trying to think outside the box and do a little things a little differently. Um, but I just had this idea of, you know, the essential or non-essential t-shirts. So this is the, I am essential. And then I, this one's for me. So I did the small business owner 
on there. But then there's also on the back, the Colossians 129 to this end, I labor, striving with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Hashtag my labor, hashtag his energy. And so just, um, you know, I know, especially like the healthcare workers, it's got to be tough right now going to work and, um, you know, maybe exposing yourself to this virus and everything. But there's also, I've just heard of all the, the good, um, like we went to Glenwood yesterday and I took my kids and we stayed our distance from other people, but we got to witness like the nurses during shift change, like going in and coming out and everybody had their lights on and we were honking and waving and people even like made signs that were like, thank you and air hugs and all that. And there was one lady, I remember or a couple of them actually, like just crying, you know, cause they were just, so thankful that you know our community is really praying for them and supporting them in whichever way we can even if it's just sitting in the parking lot and waving at them you know so if i think long and hard about the good that is going to happen to this um i do think people are going to start loving their families more you can see that already uh, with the love people have for their families and you should have unconditional love for your family already this is going to make families tighter this is going to make families appreciate that time that they have with grandma because now it's going to be hard to have time with grandma i can't go to my grandma's house right now and give her a hug i have to talk to her 10 feet through a door as she's in self-isolation and i am too but i got to take her groceries i got to check on her so for that I think it's going to bring families a lot closer. I think people are going to start communicating a little bit more. And I think people are going to start looking out for themselves a little bit more. And then maybe that'll parlay to the community. Because once you start looking out for yourself, you start looking out for everybody else as well. Once your family is contained, then you start from the outside looking in on how can I help others. 